it's amazing how Abby knows exactly when to hit the record button. She really does. It's like magic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Look, now that I have two screens, I can put you guys over there. Oh, not at the bottom though. Too far away. Hold on. I need you on the side. There we go. All right. Um, all right, so opportunities inside of command. We don't do a whole lot with opportunities inside of, well, no, that's not true. You should be doing a whole lot with op opportunities inside of command. So to get into command, it's agent.kw.com. I had to think about that for a really long time. Um, all your Keller Williams logins are the same. So in case you haven't figured it out, there's my KW, there's Keller Mortgage, there's all of them. They're all the same. So they, they cross platform all your logins in case you ever got to something new and you're like, I don't recognize that. Same one. All right. So opportunities, the way to best utilize opportunities is when you have a contact, um, right? This is what we're doing. We're working our leads with our three day or five day post open house um, smart plan that then converts into an eight by eight smart plan that then converts into the 19 to connect. And we finally get these people to respond. And they're like, yeah, actually I passed through your open house like seven months ago and we weren't quite ready then, but now we're ready to buy a house. You're gonna be like, oh my gosh, perfect. And one, we're gonna move them from a lead to a contact because now they're responding to us and having conversations. And number two, we're gonna create an opportunity for those people. So the opportunities are the ones that little hold hands. And inside of opportunities, you have your listing opportunities and your buyer opportunities. And you may decide that you want to put your people in here like the second they pass through the open house that they were talking about buying. Or you may want to wait until you have like a direct conversation that they are thinking about buying or selling. It's up to you how early you throw them into this cultivate section. But let's say they have a buyer that's like, oh my gosh, yeah, I was thinking about buying a house and I passed through your open house seven months ago. We're going to open up our cultivate um, thing here. Um, you're going to hit create opportunity, which is going to allow you then to select um, the opportunity type. I've right? got buyer, landlord, tenant, listing. So most years are either going to be listing or buyers. You can select a client here by typing in names and it'll pull information from your database. And all of your contacts in your database should be standalone, which means that if you've got a husband and wife, it shouldn't be Amy and Jay Petard. It should be Amy Petard, and then there should be a Jay Petard. They should be separate. The good news is about that is that when you go to like export your mailing list, as long as you have them connected as spouses with the same address in your command, it exports them together, which is really cool. So if I've got an Amy Petard and a Jay Petard, and then I go to export a mailing list for my monthly mailer, um, it'll combine them as Amy and Jay Petard, which is really neat, as long as the address matches and they're linked. Um, but you could add, um, so like here I've got Amy Hart and then we could H-A-R-T-T, -T, Gregory Hart. So you can add a buyer and co-buyer, right? So they're both on the opportunity, even though they're separate contacts. And then you'd want to name it. So this might be like Hart Purchase, or it could be, you know, however you want to name it is up to you. Um, and then you can add custom tags. So these are outside of, we have our tags within command and then we have our tags within opportunities that you can create. So you could like tag them with contingent, meaning they've got a property to sell, maybe the type of loan, VA, um, conventional FHA, maybe referral, um, maybe if you wanna track them that they're from open houses, whatever that would help you move them through your opportunities, purchase forward and referral, right? So you can tag them with anything in here. If you, maybe they were FHA and I don't have an FHA tag. If I type it in, it says create FHA, we hit create and it creates an opportunity tag for us, okay? Um, here's where you're gonna put your estimated close date. If you're a person that just called you up and they're like, hey, we weren't, weren't ready seven months ago, but we, we're thinking about buying now. Um, this is just an estimate. So if they're contacting us today, which is like the 15th, is it the 15th? Goodness gracious. Then um, we're probably gonna put it a couple months out. Like, hey, we're probably closing sometime before the end of August, okay? And then time frame would be one month, two months, three months, four months. This isn't required. So you could leave this estimated close date um, blank and not put anything in there if you didn't want to. And then you could put a time frame of like in the next three months. Okay, so you can do, I would probably do either or, not both. 
Um, here's their budget. If you kind of know what their price range is looking at, you can fill that out. But again, we're not, um, this isn't required. There's no red asterisk by it. So if you wanted to skip this until they got pre-approved, then you could skip it for now. Here's where you're going to put your commission rate. Your average commission for a purchase transaction is usually two and a half percent. So that's usually what I fill in there. And then where do we want this opportunity to go? Is it going to go and cultivate or an appointment? Like, are we scheduling an appointment with them, with this buyer that called in? They're like, hey, I'm ready to go. Or I think I'm ready to go. Or we're probably going to put them instead of cultivate, like probably in the last seven months, they should have been in cultivate, like moving them along, trying to get them to an appointment, right? But now we're probably going to put them in the appointment stage. And then um, we either have scheduled or confirmed there. So... Um, and mine are going to be different than yours, just so you know. So my, um, the opportunity phase is all going to be the same. You've got the, op the option of cultivate appointment active. Um, and, but as far as opportunity stages, those you can edit. So mine are probably going to be a little different than yours. And then you may not have this assignees here, not a big deal. Um, that gives you the ability because I've got a team. And then you're going to hit create. And then it's going to pull up that opportunity in here. Now, what's cool about opportunities is you can do all sorts of things with them. It allows you um, to track along with them. So now if I go back, we're going to go to our say, oh, let's go sales pipeline. So here's my opportunities page again. So now it shows me that I've got three people in the appointment stage. And if I click on that, here's my people that um, I can move along. I've got Devin Robinson who is scheduled. He actually is confirmed. And then you can drag them along with right that. So if I've got the heart purchase and I'm like, perfect, why don't we come in and talk about doing needs and you know, talk about kind of what you're looking for in a home, what your time frame looks like, your plans and kind of get you going in the right direction. They're like, perfect, that sounds great. And so we schedule that appointment. Now they're in scheduled. You can um, go in there, click on it. It opens it up. And this um, is going to be where, see, we've got appointments scheduled. So I can come up here and hit edit and scroll down here. And this is where we can put in when's their appointment, right? So we could say, oh, we have an appointment on Friday. Um, is there appointment? Oh, the appointment scheduled was today, which is the 15th. And the appointment date is the 17th. And then here you've got some other dates you can fill in and that just allows you to track it a little further along. So now I know that I have an appointment with them on the 17th and it should show up on my task list for the day that we have an appointment. Okay, we may need to tweak a couple other things to make that happen, but that's kind of where we're at. Um, let's see if we go back to buyer appointment and then once like tomorrow, I'm probably going to need to confirm that appointment. So I've scheduled it. And now I probably need to go back tomorrow and say, hey, just confirming that we're still good for our appointment tomorrow on the 17th at 10 a.m. or 2 p.m. or whatever time it was. And then once they confirm, then I would move them along. My thing's not working <coughs> to confirm. So we just click and drag. If yours looks different, it may look like a list. So it may look like that. And you can toggle between those on the right hand side of the page between board view and list view. Hey, Amy, yes. you know, the, the percentages next to at the top 20 and 30%, uh -huh. are those just your conversion rates or. Yeah, so, so that's your conversion rate. Once we have a scheduled appointment, how likely is it that that transaction is going to close? Okay. I noticed then, there's defaults, but do you adjust those depending on your business or. Yeah, absolutely. You can go in there when you go into edit stages, here's where you can edit those um, probabilities. So as you're tracking your rates as far as like over this next year, if you're tracking how many scheduled appointments you have and how many got to confirmed and then how many of those confirmed got to, you know, buyers and then how many of those buyers actually closed, you can kind of track your probability and adjust it as necessary. Okay, thanks. Yep. And this is where you would also add stages for, um, or edit those stages. And you can also, which this is a good lead way because it brought me into this page here, right? I just hit edit stages. You can add checklists. So if I have a scheduled appointment, I could add an item that says confirm appointments the day prior appointment. 
right? And I can hit save. And now anytime I put somebody into the scheduled appointment, it's going to show up with um, that checklist of items of what I need to do. So I can click on it and be like, oh, I confirm the appointment, right? I could add another item, maybe mail out a $5 Starbucks. Right. So now maybe I've got two items in that. So now when I go back to the checklist, if I had somebody in the scheduled appointments, it shows up with this checklist here and then I can click on it and know what I need to do. You can also, once you move into that, I could set due date. <clears throat> so maybe I want to confirm the appointment the day before. So I'm going to click on the 16th at 10 a.m. Sounds good. And then I could set the due date on this one as well or I could assign it. So if you had other people like an assistant, like I could go in there and assign this to Abby to send out a gift card on the 16th. And then she would get notified on her command to do that. So as you begin growing your team and adding admins and stuff, you have the ability to assign tasks to different people. Um, where this one, I'm just gonna assign it to myself. And then that would show up on the day at the time on my task list of things that I need to actually do. That's so okay. cool. So fancy. So fancy. You can use it to automate your business, right? So cool that you can have this tool in there. These items automatically appear once I add them in there. I just go in and update the timeframes. In fact, I may even decide that um, that here under edit stages, maybe one of my check checklist items should be add item, should be update. Because I'm kind of dense, and if it's not on a list, I probably am not going to do it. So here, save. So now I have three items on that checklist, and when I go back into this appointment, this one didn't because I'd already moved it there, but it would add a thing that says update the due dates, and then I would know, oh, I need to update my due dates, and then I update that, check it done, and then once I confirm appointment, I would check that done, and then once that gets mailed out, that gets checked off, and you can see like if you assign it to other people, what everybody's done their tasks. What is the client update thing? So yeah, so the client update is, um, if it's something that you want the client to be kept updated of, then when you check it off, um, it would send them an email once a day of here's the things that were completed on your file. So as you move like a listing um, further along into like an active status or the pre-marketing type status, um, or you've got a buyer transaction in contract, you may want some tasks in there like schedule appointments, schedule inspections, or schedule appraisal, check-in with, with lender to make sure that we're on track. And you can set those to automatically update the client that when you mark them done, they would get an email once a day of all the tasks that were completed on their file for them. And it would say, you know, Kate has completed the following items in preparation for your listing hitting the market. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. So, um, and inside, so if, if I went into here and task and hit create item, maybe I need to add another item. We lost Melissa, she's coming back. We could add an item to the checklist. Item. And hit save. We could set a due date and assign that as well there. So if I add it inside of that opportunity specifically, then it's just specific to this opportunity in this stage. Where versus if I go into edit stages and add tasks here on the checklist, then anytime I move somebody into a scheduled appointment, it's going to automatically assign those tasks to anybody in that appointment. Oh, very nice. Okay. Can you can you say that one more time? So my brain, <laughs> I opened yeah. up the bigger screen because I couldn't see on my phone. Yeah, absolutely. So if inside of edit stages where I can edit everything, if I add tasks to the checklist inside of edit stages, then any new opportunity I move into that stage, it will assign all of those tasks to that opportunity versus if I'm inside this opportunity checklist here and I add an item inside the single opportunity, it just adds it to this one opportunity. So if we, um, confirmed the day prior to, and when I talked to them, they sounded kind of wishy-washy. 
then I might want to add another item that says confirm morning of set at 8 a.m. on the 17th, just specifically to this one. I could add that item here and it wouldn't add it to all of them, just the one that I'm adding it to, um, just this one specific opportunity. Got it. So you would only check the client update box if you wanted your clients to know of that task. Like if you put wishy-washy, let's make sure you wouldn't want them to see that. Like they wouldn't see that, right? <laughs> no, like they probably don't need to know that I confirmed their appointment the day prior to, or even that I sent them out a gift card. So I probably wouldn't leave those um, client updates where client updates come in is like schedule photos or schedule um, inspections or um, you know, post property on Facebook or share property to, you know, like all those type things, those you may want to keep your client updated of what you're doing without having to text them individually. Um, so those you could update. So just so I'm, I'm understanding, as soon as you check that, it sends it, or do you have to like press confirm or something in order for it to like shoot off to them? Yep. So inside of here, if you go to your name at the top page and you go to your settings, And then we wait patiently. All right, if we go into command settings and then opportunity settings, here's your client updates. And here's where, hold on, it's thinking really hard. We're just gonna wait patiently. We're not gonna continue clicking on it. So I've removed my hands from the keyboard because I have problems. <laughs> I know it'll open up eventually. There it goes. All right. So here is your client updates. So it'll send them once per day and you can set what time you want those up those updates to go out, whether it's like 6 p.m. every day or 3 p.m. or 10 a.m. Um, and then who it sends to the client and co-client or just the primary client. And then also who, like if you've assigned people like in ours, I don't know what your business looks like specifically, but because we're a team, we can add assignees to our file. So it'll send it to all assignees or just the owner of the file. Um, and then that's kind of what it looks like um, inside of there. And so that's kind of how you set that up. Does that make sense? Yes. And so that's just a staple for everybody. So anybody, you can't alter it. Like if someone's like, I want to get messages at 5 p.m. every day, you, you can't do it per client. Then. No. So instead of asking them, you're just going to set the expectation of anything that I do um, as far as marketing or whatever. I'll keep you updated every day at 6 p.m. You got it. Okay. Tell me of what's been completed if you wanted to set that expectation. Perfect. Um, down here at the bottom, it says I'm currently using the default email template and I can preview that. So here's what that would look like. It would come out with, um, you know, the client's name. We're checking things off the list. Here's a summary of tasks completed for, and it would have the address. Um, it would have your name and logos up here. And then checklist item one, two, three, and so anything that got marked off, it would put them in a list here by your site at every step, Irene, and then had your information in there. Nifty, and is there a spot where we could um, edit that if we chose, or we just, that's just the default, that's what you get? You know, that is a fabulous <laughs> question, and maybe Carrie can chime in. I'm sure that there is a place where this can be edited. I'm just not sure exactly where that is. I think it's pretty standard, but I'll check on that and get back to you. <laughs> Sounds good. You guys will have a benefit that the uh, tech person is also the PC coach here in another week. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm not sure how to change that. Carrie will get back to us. All right, so that's, that's your client updates there. We'll go back to opportunities. The nice thing is the reason we use this is, and we, the reason we have those conversion ratios on there is that once it, it loads, it's gonna show us based on what's in here as opportunities, what our potential and our probable income is. 
So our potential income is going to be all of the opportunities inside your command, where your probable income is going to be, hey, based on the conversion ratios, this is really what you're looking at. So potential um, based on buyers that I have in my pipeline is 202,000. Probable is about 92,000. So it's all based on those conversion ratios. Okay. Um, if you want to move somebody along, so we moved them from scheduled to confirmed. When you move them from one place to another, the task list doesn't follow them. It assigns them the new task list for that new category, just so you know. So those old things are going to fall off and go away, whether you did them or not, and the new one will be assigned. And then if we wanted to move them from like confirmed to now they're an active client, we can drag them up here and drop them into active. And then if we click on that, they've magically moved over here into the um, next stage here. And maybe they're getting their lender pre-approval. We can just keep moving them along. Maybe we're searching and showing homes. Can I squeeze in a question? Um, hey. So let's say we accidentally pick up the wrong person and we didn't want them to be moved. And now that thing is gone, if you put them back, will it? bring back the checkoff list you were dealing with before, or are you starting all over again? That is a fabulous question. Let's take our person and move them back to appointment and then move them back. Oops, that's the wrong person. Move them back to scheduled because that's where I had the checklist. It brings them back with your oh, checked off yeah. items already there. Okay, good. Because, you know, grab that wrong person. That would be a sad moment. <laughs> That would be a you about might that cry. Too. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. So you're okay if you have a sat, if you grab the wrong person. <laughs> Good to know. All right. Um, so we can move that person along. Now, in the very least, so here's, right, so you can utilize this. This you could log into every single day and know exactly who you should be following up with and calling and who's doing what and where you've got people in your pipeline, which is kind of fun and handy. Um, the way that you have to use this, so this is all how you should use it, right? You should be using opportunities. You should have those checklists in there. Um, it's going to help automate your business, make your life simpler, help people not to get lost and fall off the radar, right? This is all fabulous. Um, so you should be doing it. The reason you have to use it is this is how you're going to get paid is inside of opportunities. So if what I said so far wasn't enough motivation, you should put your opportunities in here at least once they get under contract, we would move them to under contract. Um, and then from here, maybe we got under contract. So from here, we can open this opportunity. You would go into offers and commissions. So just so you guys know, here's your details of your opportunity. If you need to edit anything, you're going to click it here. Um, don't forget once we enter into contract or if it's a listing to make sure you put the property information here. This is the number one hiccup that happens is that we miss this address right here, especially with our buyer, well, even with our listings, because oftentimes we name the opportunity like um, 1313, we're just going to pick 4th Avenue, Seattle. Um, we might name the opportunity that, but we don't actually put the address in. And then when we try to move forward in our transaction with getting our commission demand, we keep getting an error message. It's usually because we didn't actually enter the address. Okay. So we're going to hit save. Um, this allows you, right? So even if it was like a referral, you could plug in the address of whatever that referral transaction is. But here's where you can edit any of that information. Now, if the hearts decide they break my heart and they're like, Amy, we've decided you're not the agent for us. We're going to go with somebody else. And you're like, it's so sad. I'm going to go cry in the corner. It's all right. There's another buyers out there. We'll figure it out. Or maybe they decided, hey, we decided we're going to hold off. We're not going to buy whatever that is. We would want to tag that as a lost opportunity. Right. So this is where your conversion ratios are going to come into play is where is that opportunity getting lost? Did we schedule the appointment and they never showed up? Did we get them in the contract and then they fell out because they decided they didn't want to buy? Like, where are we losing these opportunities? When the opportunity is dead, we would hit lost opportunity. Now, if this buyer just decided not to buy that house, but we're still looking for another house, they wouldn't be a lost opportunity. We would just move them back to showing and searching for properties. Okay. And, and if they did, um, like if they just decided they want to push it out a year or something, they're technically not a lost opportunity. They're just pushing it out. Right. Or would you, how would you claim that one? 
Um, I would probably, all right, so in that case, you could either go lost opportunity and then create a new one under cultivate or take this opportunity and move it back to like cultivate. Um, that's up to you. Technically, if they're thinking more than a year, I would probably call it a lost opportunity for this year. If it's going to run out of time within this calendar year, I would probably mark it as a lost opportunity and create a new one. If they're still going to buy this calendar year, then I would move them into different um, places in the, the cultivate. Got it. So you would put it as a lost opportunity because it wasn't happening, but you would start it again into cultivate so that way that you can obviously know that those are people you want to stay on more top of mind. Is that what you're saying? Top of mind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I would probably just, so my conversion ratios track appropriately, I'd probably go ahead and mark it for this year as a lost opportunity. They've decided not to buy this year. Perfect. I Thank you. I don't know what the accurate option for that is, but yeah. Hey, Amy. There you go. Um, buyer profile, this is going to kind of be, if they've opened the app, it'll tell you here that they are associated with the, the consumer platform on the app. And um, once they've assigned themselves to the consumer platform, you could assign your buyer guide to their, um, their profile. For the buyer guide, mm -hmm. um, it does not show up automatically on the, on the app. You have to assign it for them. It does show up automatically, but I believe it starts with like the check boxes if you assign it to them. It just keeps them more aware of, I think it sends them a notification or something. Okay, I got another question um, <laughs> for the stage cards because I'm just looking at the ones that are defaulted here. Uh -huh. What does legacy mean? Oh, so legacy you can delete. The okay. legacy was created because when we moved over to command, a lot of our agents were using what's called dot loop. And it was, they moved over the opportunities from dot loop in the command. And that was one of the categories that they needed in order to make that transition happen. But we don't use dot loop and it, we've since converted. So you could delete legacy. Sounds good. Thanks. Yep. I have a fuzzy in my eyeball. All right. Documents. Um, we used this briefly. This would be like sky slope for command. Um, we are not utilizing this inside of command right now. We're using Skyslope just because command wasn't quite robust enough for what our needs were to make sure that we stayed out of legal problems and able to find stuff. Um, so that's this. But if you wanted to, you could add a custom folder in here and you could call it like client docs and click private and hit create. And then if you wanted to store their like their pre-approval in here or anything like that, you could create this and then store those documents in here. Anything that would be handy and helpful for this transaction. I, I had seen that one and I had thought about like, you know, for some, if you have the um, exclusive, what is it for the buyers, um, yeah. you know, sign, but like, you know, like for instance, I have a client that they were going to buy, decided they wanted to wait and but they had that signed agreement that that way I can see it at a quick glance that, oh, I have that document versus having to go into car or Skyslope or whatever. Well, not Skyslope, but you know, car. Yeah, that would be a great way to be able to store those inside of command and have those within the opportunity that that uh, BRE, the buyer representation agreement or um, pre-approval letters or whatever. So you're not searching through your email or DocuSign or zip forms looking for those items. Absolutely. Um, once we're in contract, you want to go to offers and commissions. Here's where you can hit add a new offer. This is where, like, you might call it, um, what do we have, 1313 something street, Washington. We might put the address there and hit create offer. And you can track all of the offers submitted so that you knew exactly what properties you made offers on and what they were if you wanted to. You don't have to, but the one that you actually get accepted does need to get in here. We're going to put the offer date um, when we're expecting that offer to close. You're going to put the property address in here. Um, you would then go to parties. And if you notice it, it kind of auto populated, you could also select from um, KWLS. So if we want to search 1313 Fourth Avenue. I have no idea what property this is. Oh, no, it's not going to show up. Let's go back. Let's see if something comes up that way. All right, we could select it from here. 
at which point it would auto populate the address. So you can either just type it in or select it from the MLS. And then you go parties. Here's where you come in, put in the buyer's names, the seller's names. Um, this doesn't have to be super exact. Okay, we're not running this through compliance. So sometimes like I might put um, just like Mr. Mrs and then whatever their last name is for the sellers, or I might put the seller's names or kind of whatever there. Um, I'm just looking for things with red asterisks. Here's where you would put the agents for the um, seller. You put their information in here, and then you're gonna go to terms. And then here's where you're gonna put in their terms. Um, this would be their financed amount and their cash amount to equal the sales price. So if we are gonna finance 450,000, and put $50,000 down, right? You just filled this in on the RPA, so you should have that information. Their earnest money is gonna be uh, 500, 5,000. The option fee, if you're probably never gonna utilize that, so just ignore that that even exists, or even termination of option, we don't use that here for asking the seller to contribute any closing costs, you put it there. <coughs> and then you can go agent analysis, pros, cons, you can just skip over that and hit save. Now we have the offer in there. And then if they accepted that offer, we could hit accept. Or if they rejected our offer, we could hit reject. So we could kind of track through that offer process if we wanted to. Or if you just did it after they accepted our offer, we would just hit accept. And then once you hit accept, that opens the manage commissions tab. So again, this is the really important thing because this is what's going to get you paid once you have a transaction. You come in here and you're going to hit edit general information. Our contract date was today. Close date is the 15th. And then you can edit your agent payment. So this is where you would put in, um, like, you're going to add a deduction. We're going to call it KWVV transaction fee, payable to KW Back of Valley. And the amount's gonna be $150. And it's gonna be 312 Surden Street. And I don't know the office phone number. So I just put my phone number and we hit save. So that deduction goes in there. If you had a transaction coordinator, you could add that deduction. If you were paying the PC program or your mentor, you could do that as well. We hit save changes. Um, you could also split, if you're splitting it with another agent, you could hit add other agent and you can search for their name. There we go. And then we would split it. Let's say that Kate's getting a 10th of this or 10%. We would hit 0.1 for 10% and then hit calculate. And then it adds her in there. And maybe we wanted to add something to hers. We could do that as well. And then hit save changes. Now though, I'm gonna get an error message because we're out of, I've got 0.1 going to uh, Kate, and I've got a one going to me, so now I need to edit, edit mine because it should only total one and go 0.9 and then hit calculate and save. So that's how, in a nutshell, how you would do your commission demand, and then you would hit submit. I'm not going to hit submit because it's not a real transaction. I don't really want a broker or a commission demand, and you should do this within 24 hours of an accepted offer. So that's what you have to do inside a command. Everything else is what you should do inside of command. So if you wanted to just so you could track, um, but you weren't actually going to submit um, a commission or yeah, demand that thing. Um, could, how do you do it? How do you skip over that? Can you skip over it? Does that make sense? I want to be able to track my last two, but since I was the second agent on them, I don't, we didn't put it through me for the command or demand of commit. What the heck am I trying to say? <laughs> Demand commission demand. demands. Right. Demand and demand. Um, you could have still put it in. Well, you could still put it in there and hit submit. And then um, if you and Mila, you guys would have, anyways, you could have put them both in there. You could have put them in Mila's and you could have put them in yours. But most of the time we don't um, do it that way. I wonder if, let's go back. Hold on. Deal owner assignees. 
Oh no, it has to be from it has to be from your thing. I was going to say, I wonder if you could choose other agents, and you can't. Um, so you you to track okay <clears throat> whether the commission demand or not is completed doesn't make a difference on when you look at your pipeline over here what your potential versus probable is. So if you had one that you were sharing with another agent, maybe the other agent did the actual commission demand, you would still want to go in here and make sure the commission was accurate. Oops, move for buyers. So we would still want to go in here. Um, I think we're under contract now. Hard. So I would still want to come in here and click on this and update this information for the actual property that we're in contract for. So um, more so than the commission demand itself is I would want to come down here and put in, like if we got in the contract at 568, I would put that in there with the actual commission, the full commission rate and hit save, which would then update my probable and my um, um, whatever the other category is, probable and potential that way. See how I changed that and updated this probable income. And then, I mean, like when you're sliding in, I could go and then slide it into close, like it's done. And then that way it would like kind of give me correct numbers in that degree. Yes, it would. Okay. So, so you can put it to close without doing a commission. Yes. Um, okay, cool. Okay. So I could Sweet. keep moving Thank this you. along and move it over to closed. And it would ask for my close date. We're going to go ahead and say today. And then that's going to show up under closed. Got it. Perfect. Yep. Thank you. Kate, did that answer your question regarding opportunities? Yes. Thank you. Was that more than you could have ever imagined? Sure. <laughs> I didn't have any set expectations, so um, I don't know how to answer that. All right, but yeah, so you can track them in there from cultivate through appointment, active, under contract, and closed, and then inside of each of those categories, you can edit those stages and edit your probability in there, and then add those checklist items. I think those checklist items really are going to be where you win or lose inside of opportunities because that's going to set up your task on how they're assigned and when they come due to keep you on top of your, really automate your system. I know you showed this to us before, but could you, could I see the stages you have for under contract? Yeah. So this is my buyer under contract. <coughs> I have under contract. I talked about maybe switching this up a little bit, but whatever. Um, I have under contract inspections, appraisal, repair request, financing, and clear to close. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yep. And under active, I have um, on hold. So these would be like my people that would like they've their credits not in the right spot or wherever they're at that need to go back into pause mode for a temporary. Um, and then we have lender pre approval, search showing, writing offers, negotiations, and then they would move to under contract. But like if we went and showed a property over the weekend, we knew they were going to review offers on Tuesday, then I would move, move them over to writing offers so that I remember that I need to write their offer on the associated timeframes and check in with their lender and do all those fun things. And then once we've submitted the offer, it would go into negotiations. And then from there, we would either go back to showing and searching or to under contract. And my listings... Uh, on active, we have pre-listing, active listing, negotiations for my active listing. And then once it's under contract, we have accepted offer inspections, appraisal, financing, and clear to close. Hey, Amy. Yes. I mean, um, so on when you have the opportunity in there and say that um, you have two for the same person, instead yeah. of doing lost opportunity, I remember you had said something how we could delete that where it won't affect 
something else? <laughs> yes. Okay. So we can go in here and you can click on the three dots. Oh, you should be able to um, somewhere. I don't know what it's asking me to do, but we're just, you know. oh, that's for DocuSign Rooms. It should give you, <clears throat> it hates me today. Sorry. Oh, the archive? Is it the archive? Yeah, it should give you the option, the archive. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, I see mine now. And I wasn't sure if that was it or not. And then another thing is that when you put an offer and then the offer is accepted, but then your buyers pull out of it or the contract cancels, how can you go in? Because I'm looking and I'm pretty sure my TC did this. Um, that's why it's duplicated because I already had them in and then she created one and then accepted the offer. So then it looks like we're in contract. How do I now go back and change that out of, yeah, right there. How do I get that? You're going to hit, um, well, you know, nothing seems to be working like it did a week ago. Um, you used to be able to hit change response, but now they've taken that away from us <laughs> Add a new offer. I wonder, oh, you know what, why I, hold on. I know why, hold on. All right, hold on. We're going to move this back to active status. There's some things you can only do when your offer's in like active um, status versus I've got it enclosed right now. So if I move it back to like active and now go into offers and commissions. Nope, it's still not going to let me. It hates me. Mine All is right. not there either. Yeah, mine is not there either because I moved them both back to showing and now they're both sitting there but I know my TC has my password and stuff so I was like well it shouldn't be like under her information where I can't edit it it should I should still be able to touch it but it won't let me you should that's what you think <laughs> no Hold on. we're just going to create a new offer I don't know how to get rid of. Um... Could it be because she already maybe submitted a CDA for it and that needs to be canceled somehow? I don't know if she did or not. I'm just trying to think outside the box. Maybe. Okay, so let's go back. Um, let's stop messing with this one. Hold on. Let me go back and mess with my fake one. I don't know where I left them. I've lost them. Oh, here we go. All right, so let's move this back. Yes. I just went into the, um, okay, I just went into the, what is this? I went into view commission and then it says request termination. So maybe I need to do that first because that's going to not be a demand, right? Because it's gone. So maybe yeah. I should eliminate that and then maybe it'll let me do what you said. Try that. Is it real? All right. So now, okay. So once I pulled it out of closed, I didn't have the access to be able to archive it anymore in closed. Let's move it back just for kicks. All right. So if you have somebody, <clears throat> oh, because I confirmed closing date, that's why. All right. So if we had somebody, that was moving along. This one went to closed. And once it was in closed, it doesn't give me the opportunity. Oops. To archive it anymore. 
But if I took it out of close and moved it back to under contract, let's look at that one. So once I'm in under contract, I still don't have the ability once you're under, under, under contract to archive it. I can just view details, which means that I probably can't do anything with the offers either. Now here I can change response now. So that's what you want to do is you want to change response and it's going to clear everything. Is that what you want to do? Yes. So here I can go back and reject it. And then the other thing that we had was um, if you've got a buyer that um, you've got two transactions created, like you created one or you forgot you created it and then you went in there and created another one or you've got your transaction coordinators duplicated it. If we move it back to active, one of them to active, whichever one you don't want, um, now I can come in here and I can archive that opportunity. So instead of marking it as a lost opportunity that messes with your, um, your percentage close, what's that called? Why can't I come up with the name right now? Your probability of closing. Um, if you archive it, it doesn't count it as a lost opportunity. It just basically deletes it is what it's, it's set up to do. So it doesn't mess with um, that. Uh, why can't I come up with a name? It's not percentage, probability, anybody? Anyways. That person potential or GCI. Yeah, but not that. It's um like your turn rate. What is that? <laughs> we talked about it earlier. Now it's gone. I don't know. Anyways. <laughs> what? Conversion rate? Conversion rate. Thank you. <laughs> I was like, I can't come up with it now. Your conversion rate. It won't mess with your conversion rate to market as a as a archived versus lost. So if they decided they were under contract and then we did the commission demand, you could go in there and on your commission demand, you could hit, um, here, let's just do it for kicks. So yeah, I see what you're saying, Amy. So when I terminated mine, it has a big termination thing and it's saying pending approval. So I think somebody has to approve it before I can do all this, what you're telling me. You can do all that. So. But at That's, least I know how now, so thank you. Yes. So if you've got somebody that fell out of contract, they're going to go back and look. You want to come back and unaccept that offer and throw them back into the active searching status and then move them back through that transaction. So they go back to showing and searching. You can also, if you have problems with this dragging process, <clears throat> if you hit view details, and then edit right here. You can go in there and change the active, the opportunity phase here. So I can move them from active to under contract. And then inside of under contract, I can move them into any of those stages. So you can move them over here if you're having problems dragging them. Any other questions today? I've got a couple in the chats. Um, at this time, there's no customization to client update emails. You can change your profile settings to add your logo, et cetera, and it pulls the picture of the house based on the address you put in. So that was the update on um, the client updates. Thank you. Yes, Carrie got us that update. All right, and then we're going to archive this one because it's not a real opportunity. So there we go. Good question. Ta da. Um, when I had almost everything done for my listing and we were in contract, when I'm on zip forms, I just restarted a new one. Like, do you just have to archive the old one and then start fresh? No. So on zip forms, I would just keep using the same file. I never sure. create. Um, so if it's a listing, you're in contract, you fall out of contract, not a big deal um, because on Oh, I guess I can archive the whole thing in there and then start a new. 
Yeah, you could if you wanted to, but because it saves all the signed documents mm -hmm. in here, um, in DocuSign, anything you've sent out signed, it creates a little folder for that. I would just keep using the same file. I wouldn't archive it. I wouldn't create a new file. I would just keep using it and change the buyer's names for future buyers um, that come in and just keep using the same file. I do the same thing with my buyers. If my buyers come in and we write an offer on a property and it doesn't get accepted and we write another offer, I just keep using the same file. And then um, at the end, I've got one file that has everything in there. So like if we look at the Smith purchase file. How do you keep it organized or how do you, I don't, okay, I'll see what you do. So like here's a buyer file. So if I go into documents, um, you've got, this was the first offer we submitted here. And then here's the second offer. So anytime you sign something, it puts it into a folder for you of the signed document. So that's kind of what I look at more so than anything. Um, so you'll see, I've got some buyers. Because it also doesn't let you with the forms, doesn't it lock you into seller counter one, seller counter two? to you no. can go back and reuse those oh okay so like sky ranch vacant land purchase highway 50 offer so i just keep using the same files okay thank you all right